Welcome, everyone, to the Viva Connections in SharePoint Framework Bi-Weekly Sync. My name is Hugo Bernier, and I will be your host for today's call. We have a busy agenda. We have the latest updates on SharePoint Framework. We have our patterns and practices updates where we'll go through uh, the majority of our, of our initiatives and talk to you about what's happening. We'll have picture time with Together Mode where you are welcome to share your camera, and uh, we'll do a cool picture with that. And then we have the best part of these calls, the demos. Uh, we'll have uh, Sergey Schwabauer, who will talk about building advanced interactive world map for business information using SharePoint Framework. We're going to have Eve Habersat, who is going to talk about creating Viva Connections extensions with user presence status using Microsoft Graph Presence API and SharePoint Framework. And finally, we'll have Davida Mari and Paolo Pialorsi exposing business data in Microsoft 365 using Azure Data API Builder and SharePoint Framework. Hey, I see a theme here. All right, and if you want to stay up to date with what's going on in our community, you can attend our Microsoft 365 and Power Platform community videos, and you can uh, follow the links here at aka.ms slash community slash videos. You can also go to our LinkedIn groups for discussions. You can go to our open source initiatives, which are all located in GitHub, and you can contribute to these initiatives. You can also visit our sample galleries, and now we have a lot of sample galleries, but they all roll up under one place at aka.ms slash community slash samples. And we have our total open source initiatives and samples. If you don't want to remember all the links that we listed before or shown on the screen, you can just go to one aka.ms slash community slash home. And speaking of community and community calls, we have our Microsoft 365 and Power Platform community calls. Coming up, we have a weekly series with Microsoft presenters called the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform. And then we have our monthly Power Platform community call. We have our Microsoft Identity Platform monthly call. We have our Office add-in monthly call, as well as, of course, the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform community call, which is bi-weekly, and the Viva Connections and SharePoint Framework bi-weekly call. You can get all the recurrent invites and they'll show up in your calendar at aka.ms slash community slash calls. And speaking of community calls, our next call is going to be the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform, uh, which is again run by Microsoft speakers on the 28th of March at 8 a.m. Pacific time. And we're going to have the latest news from directly from Microsoft Engineering on the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform topics. We're always going to have our community together mode and we'll have demos by Luca Bandinelli, John Guyan, Alex Trentiev on the SPFX 117 release, what's new and what's there. Rabab Otmani was, is also going to talk about the Kyoto SDK generator. And Gary Trinder is going to talk about deploying a Teams app to Azure using Teams Toolkit for Visual Studio Code. And if you're interested in speaking at any of these community calls, you can request to present. Everyone is welcome to speak at our community calls. If you have something cool to share, we would love to see it. So go to aka.ms slash community slash request slash demo. We like our slashes. Um, and you can actually uh, just tell us a little bit of what you want to present, and you too could be a presenter at one of these calls. Now, if you are interested in presenting or you're interested in contributing to some of our samples, we have some guidance to help you on how to get started. And to talk about this is my friend David. Uh, no, you covered it, Hugo. Back to you. No, I'm just kidding, everybody. All right. Yes, sharing is caring. What is it? It is live. It is hands-on. It is safe space opportunities for us to work together more. And as Hugo had mentioned, it is here to help you do more in the community. That means contributing a pull request on GitHub. If you've never done a pull request or if you're looking to demo on these calls, we've got some first-time presenters all the time. We want to support you. So these are always getting scheduled. We've got more coming up in April. We just retooled our first time contributor, uh, beta tested it with some MVPs. It is really going to be great. So look for new dates for that in April and May. Again, safe space. We don't record these t uh, sessions. And so you're free to ask any and all questions that you would like. Now, once you have contributed to the community in a plethora of opportunital ways, yep, I just said opportunity, making words up. <laughs> you are going to be recognized for that. 
in the community recognition program powered by Credly. Yes, that same Credly that gives you those badges when you get certified, we got them too. And we want to recognize you for the amazing stuff that you're doing in the community in a variety of ways. We're always coming up with fun new themes as well that are uh, calendar-based and short-term so that you can have a lot of fun with us in the community. Just need you to opt in for this, ak.ms slash recognition, uh, excuse me, slash community slash recognition. I uh, only need to do that once and we're also setting up some new ways for you to be able to tell if you've already opted in and we will ensure that you are recognized and taken care of. So don't hesitate. Check out the AKA. Hugo, back to you. Thank you, David. And we have a few upcoming events happening. I, and I believe this one uh, Vesa is going to talk about. And if he was not planning on talking about it, he now knows that he's talking about it. Yes, I know that I'm talking about it. So <laughs> next, uh, is this This is actually, I'm just double checking the date. Uh, it is on next Wednesday at a 9 a.m. Pacific time. There's going to be a special event where we're going to talk about extending the Microsoft Teams application uh, across the Microsoft 365. Uh, this is something which we talked about a few times in the past as well, but there are new announcements which are going to be shared within that event. Of course, it's rec uh, recorded and it will be available uh, on demand later on. Now, the next slide, uh, also we want to call out uh, the, the Microsoft 365 conference happening in early May. Uh, there is a huge lineup on the keynotes there, uh, just to make sure that everybody is aware that there's going to be a new announcements and the best CVPs and precedents in Microsoft are flying over to Las Vegas in May 2nd to May 4th uh, to talk about the latest in Power Platform, Microsoft Viva, Microsoft Teams and SharePoint. And, and again, just to recap, a lot of, lot of new stuff uh, related on Copa Pilot, OpenAI, and all of that stuff is going to be talked about within that conference. Then we go to the SharePoint framework. Now, on the SharePoint framework side, uh, just to call out, uh, we had a small data outage uh, pretty recently on the stats. That's the interesting bump on the top right and left corner. But all time highest usage data usage is currently in 20th of March, uh, which is great. It's awesome to see the continuous growth worldwide where SPFX is being used across the Microsoft 365. So, not only on SharePoint, but also on Microsoft Teams and in the Microsoft Viva. Let's go to the following slide. 1.16.1 is the current three. Uh, in production version, uh, we did release beta 3 of 1.17 uh, on Tuesday this week, and it's expected to go to GA within upcoming weeks. Uh, I would say two weeks to two to three weeks, uh, we're heading to release to 1.17. And that will include updates uh, on the Microsoft team side, also on Microsoft Viva side, technical updates on dependencies, and, and a lot of other small, uh, smaller updates here and there plus issue fixes. Now, next Tuesday, we will go more detailed on a, on a code level and with live demos to show you uh, what are the, all of the different features and capabilities in 1.17. So that's on next Tuesday's community call at 8 a.m. Pacific time. Let's continue, Hugo, on other topics. Thank you. We have many open source projects in the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform community. And to talk about it, we have all the people that are helping with these uh, initiatives. And the first one to talk about is the PNP JS client side libraries. So we have the version 3.13 that was released on March 17th, where we've added the get current memberships and the new publishing site pages import. Then we fixed the typing issues with as cancelable wrapper and drop references uh, to uh, in stream.d.ts. And we fixed the set stream content chunk to fixed unhandled promise. You can actually go get all the documentation on this on pmp.github.io slash pmpjs. And make sure to follow us on, on Twitter at m365pmpjs. And our next is to talk about the CLI for Microsoft 365. And to talk about this is our friend Gary. Thank you, Hugo. Um, so yeah, we've got new beta release of CLI for Microsoft 365, so this is 6.4. Um, we've got new commands for Planner, Power Automate, Purview, SharePoint, and also SharePoint Framework. So we've added support for upgrading your projects to the latest uh, beta release. So if you wanna test out your SharePoint framework projects on the uh, on the latest version, then the CLI is the easiest way for you to do that. Uh, but we've got lots more enhancements and updates as well. So please check out the release notes for all the details. If you want to uh, install and run the new beta, then just use the uh, the at next uh, tag uh, from npm or the the next tag on on Docker as well. Um, please, uh, if you 
not used CLI for Microsoft 365 yet, check out our docs. Uh, follow us on Twitter at CLI Microsoft 365. Uh, join our Discord um, as well uh, through our new short link. It's a bit easier to remember this one, aka.ms slash CLI hyphen M365 slash Discord. Um, we, we're really excited that the community is growing and we're seeing lots of activity on there as well. So if you've got any questions around uh, CLI, that's the place to, to post them and I'm sure you'll get to get answers. Um, if you're using the CLI uh, and you've not hit that star button on GitHub, then please go and do that now. So Microsoft Graph Developer Proxy updates. Um, so we've not got an update this week, uh, but just to remind everyone that we had uh, 0.5 release uh, at the end of last month, which included a new recording mode and execution summary as well. So when you're doing the recording, you get a nice output of, of all the activity and requests that the proxy has intercepted. We made it easier to start the proxy by reducing the name of the executable down to four characters. Um, so, uh, so that's less typing for you to do. And we had lots of other bug fixes and, and in, internal improvements as well as we go through uh, the iterations to, uh, to, to our V1 release. Um, but at the end of the month, uh, well, next week, uh, we have the next release coming up. So that'll be 06 uh, with upgrading to .NET 7, uh, looking at uh, CI, CD and Playwright support as well. So being able to use the proxy to uh, intercept requests and, and add some chaos into your UI testing using Playwright. And also adding more guidance for rate limiting, paging and client request IDs as well. Um, so if you're interested in uh, testing your applications against uh, APIs, simulating throttling errors and responses, go check that out. And uh, you can get the, the latest version, aka ms slash graph slash proxy slash download. Back to you, Hugo. Thank you. We also have a set of libraries called the uh, reusable SPFS controls that you can use in your applications. And to talk about the update, here's a man who actually sees the world as a bunch of reusable controls, uh, Alex Trantiv. Alex? Thank you, Hugo. So yeah, uh, if you're not familiar with what is reusable SPFX controls, they help you to think about business logics more in your SPFX uh, solutions and not about the UI. Uh, you can just uh, import the controls to your solution, reuse them, and in most cases, they will look similar to out-of-the-box UI provided by the Microsoft. Currently, we are on version 3.13.0 for React controls and 3.12.0 for React property controls. Uh, we had a bunch of uh, uh, fixes in these uh, latest versions and uh, some new controls as well. Uh, next release will be after uh, SPFX 117 to support 117. Uh, special thanks to all the contributors who made these releases uh, possible. And uh, feel free to contribute as well. If you see some bugs in the controls, please submit issues in our repos. Or if you feel comfortable, please uh, create APRs with uh, new enhancements, fix bugs, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. And uh, back to you, Hugo. Thank you, Alex. So in case you were wondering, gee, I haven't, we haven't heard from Vesa in a few slides. Here's Vesa to talk about Viva Connection Toolkit for Visual Studio Code. I'll be super quick in 10 seconds because we're running out of time uh, for the demos. Uh, so Viva Connection Toolkit, uh, the latest here is that we released a new version of the video series. So at AKMS forward slash Viva forward slash VS Code forward slash videos. That's me, Hugo and David uh, showcasing what does this extensibility provide. So we would love your feedback. Is this useful or not? So we know that if the engineering should be investing on this kind of a tooling for Viva development and SPFX development. So please do let us know. Thank you. Our PMP Modern Search is a series of flexible web parts that you can use to build a modern search experience. So we have a version 4.8 available, and we are looking for contributors. So if you're a programmer and you want to look at our issues list, we welcome your pull request. And you can go to aklms slash PMP dash search. And speaking of contributing to open source repositories. We have SPFX samples with extensions and web parts. We have an update to the birthdays web part by Valeras Narbutas, who updated it to SPFX 116.1. We have an update to the page navigator by Derman Mujahid. And we have a new web part called DevOps Tasks, which actually shows your tasks in 
Azure DevOps. We uh, welcome your contributions, and you will get a badge if you contribute to the uh, SPFX web part samples. And to talk about the SPFX ACE samples, here's my friend David. Awesome, thanks. And uh, yeah, Amory has brought one to us this week. Most liked pages, very, very cool. Allows you to kind of see what is the most liked, some of the details behind it, uh, being able to use the benefits of those ACEs or adaptive card extensions to compress the information, but it then expand it later when you want to see more detailed information. So thank you, Amory. And of course, we're looking forward to a demo today that was highlighted a couple weeks ago uh, on uh, the graph presence. So uh, thank you all. Again, badge, contribute. Back to you, Hugo. Wonderful. Thank you, David. And I've been making my hair pretty for the picture time. So if you want to participate in picture time, you can turn on your camera. We'll grab a snapshot and we will post that in social media to show how awesome this community is. And Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. You can see my screen. There we go. Oh, Excellent. There you go. Just took a while. So here we go. And let me put the Camtasia on. And uh, I'm all waved out now, though. Yeah, I, I know, but I haven't. I'm not recording. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, now let's put the recording on. Uh, three, two, one, and I will put the, the camera on as well. And let's wave. Excellent. Everybody is getting excellent. That's more than five seconds for the GIF animation. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And let's move to the demos of today. All right. And for the best part of the day, we have demos. And our first speaker is going to be Sergey Schwabauer. So, um, hi, my name is Sergey Schwabauer, and I work as a lead developer at Aurum in Nuremberg, Germany. I have more than 13 years of experience in SharePoint development. And recently, I started um, a blog where I regularly write and publish my solutions, SPFix App Dev. I would be happy if you visit my website. Um, today, I will uh, present uh, my SPFX web part interactive world map. I will go to uh, the ID and the highlight, highlights, what packages I use, and then show a demo um, before giving a summary. Okay, let's talk about the web part. As the name says, this is a web part that displays a world map. Now you might uh, think, wow, Sergey, that's nothing new. It's already exists by default in SharePoint. Yes, of course it is, but the default Bing Maps web part has very few configuration uh, options. The only possibility is to define a label and whether it should be displayed or not. And of course, the position or address uh, itself. Here you can see the uh, standard web part looks like. So everyone understand what I mean. Uh, my web part has the following features. Place as many markers as you want. Show marker tooltip on hover. Configure pin color, icon color, and icon. Handle the click events, um, cluster the markers, change the look and feel of the map style layer, define marker categories, and uh, show the, uh, the legend for the categories. Make uh, the map uh, aesthetic, uh, define the start location, page load, configure map zoom settings, and so on. This is um, how it looks like. Before I show the web part, I would like to briefly describe the techniques I used. The web part was developed with SPFX 1.14. I use Fluent UI components for the map itself, OpenStreetMap, and the well-known uh, Leaflet.js uh, uh, library. For Leaflet, um, there is a React uh, package, and um, also I use the uh, Leaflet plugin Marco cluster uh, and the React Leaflet Marco cluster package. And then PMP controls and uh, property controls. All markers are stored directly on the web part and not in a list or something similar. For the whole web part, I invented about um, 24 hours. In the code itself, there is nothing really interesting or cool or special to, to show because in my opinion, it's a normal web part. Therefore, um, we come directly to the demo. On this page, you can see my pre-configured web part. I have simply mapped a, a few Microsoft locations, um, one for each continent. Here you can already see how the cluster looks like, this one or that one. For example, if you click on this cluster, you will be taken directly to the, this location. Now you see two markers. One shows the headquarter, and the other one, uh, another Microsoft location. Here you can see that the um, icon differ. While the headquarters um, icon is custom configured, the other one uses a category. 
the ad advantage of categories is that they only need to be configured once and then they can be reused. If the category is customized, all markers that uh, use this category are automatically updated. In addition, um, the category can be used to display the legend. Like that. Um, the marker in this case um, is uh, set up to, to open a dialog this, uh, that displays a um, um, SharePoint page. This is an embedded um, iframe. The dialog or the page behind it, also uses this web part. Here you could write, for example, more information about the uh, uh, location. The map should be used more as a header in this case. That's why I configured it that the map is static. That means I can neither zoom in nor move. So it's nothing happens if I zoom or uh, uh, track and drop. Uh, although all buttons like search, zoom or legend are hidden. The header has become very large here, I know. So let's look at the uh, marker for Ge um, Microsoft Germany. Here also the page is opened in a dialog. Um, as you can see, the map of the uh, or the header is a bit smaller here. Um, here I have additionally configured the marker as a panel. If I click on the marker, a panel is shown. The content of the panel is configurable. Of course, this is only one of many possibilities that can be mapped uh, um, with the web part. Others could be, for example, marking all customers on a map. Plan the next team event and show the meeting points, including the information about it, and so on. Now let's see what configuration options are available. For this, I place a new web part on a new page. Um, the web part is called Interactive Map. And the web part can also be placed in a full width zone. By default, if I uh, create a new web part, London is uh, visible because London has latitude zero. This is leaflet specific. If you want to set the, the location somewhere else when loading the page, you can easily define this. To do this, we go to the location we want and right click on the map. For example, let's say we want uh, this, this view. Then we click right click and say make this view a start position. The position, that means uh, latitude and longitude, and the zoom level will be saved. As you um, uh, may have seen, you can also create a new marker by uh, clicking, uh, clicking right click. Let's try. The configuration of the marker is simple. You can either ch uh, choose a category or define each marker individually. You can define what should happen when the marker is clicked, if a panel, a dialog, or a URL uh, um, should should be uh, opened, or if uh, nothing should be happen at all, that one. You can choose the pin color, the icon, and the icon color. Here's a preview. Additionally, you can define a tooltip text. This will be displayed when hovering over the marker. And depending on which type you have selected, you can also define the dialog and the panel content. Panel header, panel content is this is a PMP um, rich text control, and same for dialog. <laughs> for the URL, you can also define how the link should be opened um, in the same window, new window, or embedded as an iframe. Um, if you have selected a category, then fewer options are available because the category specifies the pin color, icon, icon color, and tooltip. It looks like that. So for now, I don't have any uh, categories, but we will create one, get one, and um, leave it as it is. Now I use this um, as category, and as you can see, I have no uh, other um, options to, to define the color or an icon and so on. So. As already mentioned, all markers that use the category are then automatically adjusted when you change something in the category. I would like to show this briefly. I simply create more markers and select the same category. Doesn't matter where. Let's say here. Okay, and here. Okay. And now um, all markers are, are black. 
I want to change that. Let's say we use red for now. I save that, and as you can see here, all um, the markers uh, um, have changed the color, uh, the background color of the of the pin. Okay. Now, how can I delete or move uh, um, a marker? Just click on an existing marker, for example, this one. Um, and now uh, two new buttons are available. Delete and change position. The delete button deletes the marker and uh, change position over some, another way of moving it. Um, I, sh I will show you that quickly. Change position, you can now uh, move per drag and drop wherever you want. When you have the, the right position, you can uh, save it. Or, for example, you can, um, if you uh, plan to, to cancel the, the same, it will be moved back to the, to, to the initial position. OK, uh, now let's take a look at the web part settings. First, you can define how far you can zoom in or out. You can also define the height of the uh, uh, map. Um, enable dragging. Um, in map uh, allows the user to move the map to another position. Or in other words, if the pos option is disabled, the map is static like in my header headquarter example and the header a page header example. Finally, you can determine if the tooltip should be displayed or not. Now let's move um, on the next category. High layers. This is actually a very cool feature because it allows you to customize the map layer. There are many free layers, but um, also paid ones. So if you have a map box, map tiler, or whatever provider already, you, you could use them here. As I put a link here with some layers. Um, here I have uh, just an example of um, uh, layers. Let's choose one, for example, open uh, to home map. So, and then we need to um, copy this URL. And insert it here. And as you can, can see here, it's changed. Uh, you need to do the same for the attribution. Um, OK, and that's it. It's cool, isn't it? The next setting category I have called plugins and controls. Here you can, for example, activate or deactivate the marker cluster. Or hide the zoom control. Now it's here and um, not visible the zoom control. And um, additional the search box. The search box is using uh, the OpenStreetMap API to search for addresses. Let's say um, Washington. And here it will be take you there immediately. Um, the last setting option is about the categories. You can manage the categories here as well. The dialogue is the same um, as for the markers. Expect you can additionally show and hide the legend. Okay, um, that's it uh, with the settings and basically else with the web part. A quick summary. I think you can see that the web part has a lot of configuration options. It is available in PMP samples and also my own uh, GitHub repository. It's very dynamic and flexible. I hope you like it and have fun with it. It's um, also available for Teams uh, uh, tabs. Here are the links for repositories in uh, my blog article uh, about the web part. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was a fantastic sample. Sergey, I wanted to say, you know, I, I, I really like how you've actually used a lot of the PMP controls to make the web part look and feel like it's just an out of the box SharePoint web part. It looked fantastic. So thank you again. Uh, and, and let's uh, move on to Eve. We're all ready for you. Feel free to start sharing. Thanks, Hugo. Uh, hello, everybody. So today I will present you. Um, a sample that I've made uh, about uh, presence uh, API. Uh, just a few words about me before. My name is Eva Barsat. Uh, I'm working at Sword Group as a consultant, so I'm doing a lot of different things regarding to Microsoft 365, Azure, Dynamics 365, and also a poor platform. I'm living in Switzerland. 
Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP, M365 development, and uh, Microsoft, Microsoft Certified Trainer also. So feel free to reach me out on my social and website if you have any question or query uh, to ask. So for today, I will talk about Microsoft Graph uh, Presence API. Actually, you have a V1 endpoint, but uh, for this sample, uh, I took the beta, beta endpoint sorry, uh, to have a larger wide of uh, capabilities. And all these API are related to the user's presence. Uh, for example, you have capabilities like you can get the user's presence, you can uh, set the user's presence, you can clear the user's presence, set a status message, and also uh, you can track you can track the user's presence uh, with a change notification and a little bit more for the available api method you have a wide range of method like uh, to get the presence you can get the presence of multiple users you can set the presence clear the presence uh, you can set and clear the user preferred presence and also set a user status message i've highlighted uh, the concept of session of an application that is really important to understand. And basically, I will describe to you what is it. And basically, to use uh, some of this uh, API method, you need to pass uh, the ID of the present session. And basically, what it means, uh, you can have multiple present session uh, that can be active uh, simultaneously. And uh, for specific reasons, like uh, for example, if you are using uh, multiple Teams client, if you have the web, uh, desktop, and mobile client, but also if you have um, ACE, web part, or any uh, line of business application that interact with the API. So for this reason, uh, you have the concept of present session, and each session may time out and expire. So the application or whatever, it could be uh, ACE, web part, or whatever, needs to call the API before the expiration in order to keep the session alive. And uh, if you can't keep the session alive, it will reset to the default uh, status state. Sorry. Uh, with SPFX, it's a little bit important to understand because, for example, when you are developing ACE or web part, for example, with uh, SPFX latest version, uh, you, you can use uh, MS Graph Client v3 to connect to Microsoft Graph API. And behind the scene, uh, this MS Graph client v3 implements, uh, as you can, as you might know, as your AD outflow, and through the SharePoint Online client extend with this service principal. And basically, behind the scene, uh, the session ID parameter that is required in some method is nothing other than this application uh, ID uh, service principal in Azure AD. This is what you will, how it works for SPFX. Uh, just an example of how to set the presence uh, of a user. You have two endpoints, me or users. Uh, in the first, you need to provide the user ID. And the second is for the current user. And as you can see, you have a body. And you have session ID, which is the service principal ID of SharePoint Online. And you have also availability and activity. And all these parameters are a fixed list of combination. You cannot uh, set uh, what you want. It's fixed. It's a fixed list. And you have also an expiration duration. Uh, it's an ISO 86101 uh, format. Default is five minutes, PT 5M. But in, uh, in this example, you see PT 2H 30M, uh, which is two hours and 30 minutes. This is a concrete example of how to set the presence. Uh, and also, if you want to play like, I, like I've done, you can use the Graph Explorer to deal with some uh, endpoints. And uh, it's, it's a great tool if you want to start uh, playing with this API. Now, just a quick demo, because uh, this sample just implements a lot of different methods to just show you how it works. So I will switch to my Visual Studio. So here, this is the sample, the latest version, because the first version I've submitted is not really, uh, it's really simple. And in this sample, which will be available as soon as the pull request will be <laughs> approved, uh, will contain a wide range of different uh, capabilities. So I will just show you how it works. So 
this is the ace and basically you see you have the status message and actually i don't have any status message defined if i click on this button you see you have a, an interface and i can provide for example my status message which is for example hello intrusive community like this i can put a status message expiration for example i will choose four hours and you can set also the availability based on the combinations uh, you can provide so for example i will put do not disturb if i submit now you see it's okay i will close and you see now i have my status message to prove you that is working so yes i'm presenting and the the status message is really is a good set with uh, a display until uh, tonight it's really working and after uh, for example you can clear the availability if you want this will reset my availability to available or your preferred uh, presence uh, status you see it's really working so i'm available now and you can also just uh, clear the status message to get everything back to the initial state and i will prove you that everything is okay you see no status message it's okay so now the code i will show you a little bit of code now because it's interesting uh, i'm playing with two uh, entities the first is a present status which represents nothing other than a present session with a session id availability activity and expiration duration and the second thing is the status message entity so you see i have the message you have a content and a content type in my case which will be text and you have also the expiry date time which uh, which have the date time and the time zone utc by default and this kind of stuff after i have made this little service which basically expose everything uh, to play with this api so for example i have a first method that is called uh, get the current uh, user status message i'm just getting the status message of the current user through the ms graph client v3 the second one is you can set the current user status message i'm just getting a status message and an expiration and as you can see i'm just calling this method and after based on uh, what i've provided uh, as choice i can just uh, put an expiration date and after i have you see this i status message uh, object which is my request body and i'm putting my status message and the expiration date which is in the iso format and utc as a time zone but if you want you can provide a different uh, time zone also uh, i'm also have a method that just get the current user id if you need because some endpoints uh, requires the user id so you have this method and you can also you see set the current user availability so with a set presence and in this case i'm just uh, providing uh, a present status and after i'm just uh, setting all these uh, these things to the current user and the last thing is the get cu uh, current user session id as i told you you need to request the specific service principal so you see you have an endpoint for that application and i'm just getting the nap the app id of this service principal behind the scene to be able to call correctly uh, all this kind of api and after you have also the clear presence and you see you also in the clear presence you need to provide and specify the session id it's mandatory to set uh, the presence and to clear the presence and this is the sample uh, basically i can just show you the quick view because it's really uh, it's really simple not really uh, advanced but you see you have uh, on action method and i'm providing everything to call this kind of uh, of api and basically uh, you have everything uh, to deal and to interact with this api basically that's all on my side and basically back to you Hugo. wonderful thank you so much and uh, while we're concluding this let's get let's give the floor to david and paolo
and someone uh, someone awoke Vesa from his slumber. Uh, David, we see your camera. Okay, let me. Uh, Paolo, do you want to start with the slides? Okay, I can share my screen then. Okay, yeah. Let me know when you see it. We yeah. can see it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, and I can take control, so let me try. Okay, I'll give you control, just because you are yeah. a friend of mine. <laughs> of course. Now that I have control, I'm not sure what to do because uh, I can't do anything. <laughs> so maybe just uh, go well, to the I will next. be your uh, demo monkey. Just let me know what to do, and I will do it. So okay, next yeah, slide. Just, yeah, just uh, so a, a little introduction uh, about myself. I'm a SQL. Uh, I'm a SQL guy. I'm a PM uh, in the Azure SQL team. And uh, lately, we just released something that I think it can be very, very interesting for you. It's called Data API Builder. That's what I'm going to to show with the help of Paolo. And um, so let's just move to the next slide. Yeah, and I'm Paolo. Uh, I'm a solution architect. I work in a company of my own, uh, and you can find all of the info here. But let's focus on the demo. So yeah. let me move on. Yeah, David, go. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's what we're going to build, right? Uh, the, the idea is that we want to build a to-do application or at least integrate the to-do uh, list in our existing application. And to do that, you probably need to have a table and then probably you need to expose some REST API to be able to connect with uh, the SharePoint uh, uh, framework that, that you have um, at your end. And uh, and now today you can do it without writing code, basically, because uh, we just released the last week uh, a tool called uh, Data API Builder for Azure Database. That's a full name, but you know, names are maybe uh, not exactly our strong side. So Data API Builder is uh, is something that allows you, it's open source, it's a, it's an application that you can download and run offline, or even of course use on Azure, that will take your existing database or new database if you want to start fresh, uh, specify a table, and we automatically create a REST and even a GraphQL endpoint. That's what I'm going to do uh, with Paolo. So I will be taking a table, exposing it using a DAB, and then Paolo will consume it uh, into a nice application, much nicer than the one that I can build myself. This is how the API Builder, uh, uh, basically the very high level architecture, and you have the link there if you want to go and, and, and see the source code, it's available, you can download it. And uh, basically what we do is we just ask you to provide a configuration file because we want to be super transparent and, uh, and, and uh, absolutely non-intrusive in the database. So we don't touch the database at all. We just uh, use it. Uh, but of course, we need, for example, to understand uh, what is the URL you want to use to expose some table, what tables or storage procedure or views you want to expose. And so we just use a configuration file. Then Data API Builder starts, uh, read the configuration file, uh, read the, the metadata, which is basically the relational schema from uh, Azure SQL in our case, but we also support uh, Postgres, MySQL, and Cosmos DB. For Cosmos DB, you need to provide a GraphQL schema because uh, we need a schema. Um, and then uh, once we have all this information, uh, we just expose uh, the rest uh, and the GraphQL schema. Now, this is this is going to be you know kind of obvious. Uh, you say, okay, that's easy, you know, rest and GraphQL. QL. But what is what was not easy, and I think that adds a lot of value, is that we also support uh, security. So we also allow you to specify not only which REST endpoint you want to make available, but within the REST endpoint uh, also which rows uh, of data will be available to someone. So we also implemented something we call policies, which by all means are uh, row level access uh, uh, securities. And, and that is something I will show you. And uh, let's go to the next slide, and then I think we can go to the demo. Yeah, this is exactly how you install it. So if you don't uh, care about the open source part in the sense that you don't want to develop with it or at least uh, contribute to the development, uh, you just do .NET tool install and then uh, it will be installed on your machine and it's a CLI application. And then once you um, once you have installed it on your machine, the first thing you have to do is dub init that will initialize the configuration file and then dub add to add whatever you want to add as a, um, to the configuration file and then dub start. So so three command and you're done. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you. Um, something else I wanted to highlight is that, uh, of course, this is also hosted in Azure. So if you want to self-host in Azure, and that's what I'm going to do, it's super easy. You just run it in a container and it's done. If you don't even want to take care of uh, hosting, you can use uh, static web apps to basically have a full stack uh, kind of environment uh, at your end in just a few lines of code, because we also integrated uh, with Static Web Apps. So if you're familiar with uh, SWA, the Static Web Apps CLI, it's all integrated. 
So you just have one tool to do everything from front end, back end database, which is pretty nice in my opinion. Okay, let's go to the demo. Uh, let me share my screen. Here we go. So here I have a very simple table, right? A to-do table. And well, we have the ID, the title completed, and they, that's the important part. Now I, I kept everything single, <coughs> simple, but basically owner says, uh, who is the owner of a to-do item? Public means is uh, has been created by an anonymous user and therefore anyone can see it. And if you have an ID, that's belong to the ID of the user who created it. And of course, I can only see my own stuff. Paolo can only see his own to-do. And of course, you know, it goes like that. So that's the table I want to expose. What I uh, I need to do is first of all dub init and I already done it. And what you get once you do dub init is just this configuration file here, which basically says what is the connection string and the database you want to connect to, runtime information like do you want to have REST enabled, do you want to have GraphQL enabled, uh, and this is the important part for for you for SharePointing for SharePoint usage, um, the provider that you want to use to authenticate, in our case will be Azure Active Directory, and this is uh, 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 Paolo's tenant uh, and uh, an Azure Active Directory configuration. And then, and then aside the runtime configuration, you need to specify which entities need to be exposed. In this case, I am exposing uh, something I will call to do uh, that is based on the table, the BO table. Uh, it will answer to the path to do. And here you have the permission. So if someone comes in and, and doesn't present any token because that's rest, right? So you have to present a better token. You will be anonymous, and so you will only be able to see the item for which the column owner ID is equal to public. And you, you can do anything on that. I could uh, just say, okay, I only want you to be able to read, but let's say I, I want to fully support public objects. Then if you are authenticated, we will allow you to see the items that are marked authenticated, kind of a semi-private semi uh, uh, thing here, but that's the important one, sample role one. Uh, so we just inherit the roles that comes from, uh, in, in this case, Azure, Azure Active Directory because uh, the authentication provider you configured uh, is Azure Active Directory. So any role that is available there can be used here. And uh, we created a sample role uh, one. And if I present my token and the token has a sample role one, then I will be uh, identified as a person with this permission. And what I will be able to do is do anything on anything as long as uh, the row on which I'm operating as the same value of my ID in the claim. So you have uh, with the policy the ability to exactly define who will be able to see what uh, and, and also the action that is uh, or her are able to do on that. So it's pretty uh, flexible and powerful. Now to run this, it's super easy. Once I have configured my file, which by the way, it is just a, a JSON file. So if you don't like uh, uh, dub, uh, add uh, kind of uh, operation, you can just create the configuration file with any tool you want, as long as it's uh, valid against the schema that is published here. So uh, if you want to automatically ex expose all the tables, you can easily create this file on your own. And now what you have to do is dub start. This will start locally my um, the application, and now it's listening on localhost 5000 or 5001, which means that with uh, uh, Insomnia, a REST client or Postman, I can just go here, let me zoom in a bit, uh, and then I query, so of course, this is the one on Azure, let me just uh, use the local, the local one, localhost 5001, and uh, that will be, uh, you know, connecting to my local database and my local database is now connecting to, to Azure and this is my table, right? And as you can see, I can only see the public item because uh, right now I am not providing uh, any, um, any, any better token, right? There is no, actually, this is disabled and probably this better token is, is expired. So if I try to do that, I will probably get an error uh, because of course now the token is expired. Um, but that's, that's to show you that everything, first of all, can work offline which is great for a development experience. If I want to deploy it, this is super easy. So first of all, everything I'm showing you is available on a GitHub repo that I created just for this sample. And here you have an Azure deploy file. I'm, I'm more confident with a shell file than ARM and BICEP. So everything here will just use AZ to deploy basically what? This thing here, uh, web app. 
that uses a container behind the scene. So if I go to the configuration, uh, there is a uh, that API builder is also published as a container on the Microsoft public registry. So here I'm using a container and, and basically what the container is doing behind the scene is just uh, using uh, uh, .NET instead of WCLI to execute a data API builder engine. And that's it. That's, that's basically what you need to do. Um, once you deploy it, you will see that we are taking uh, the image from here. So that will be the, la the, the latest one. And then I can just go here. That's what I already had prepared before. So, and now I'm I'm going I'm going to the YAM web app, the the basically the same website uh, you have here. Yep, that's the same website. Now again, I'm using Insomnia, but uh, what will happen right now is that uh, of course I st uh, still get access uh, to all my items here, right? All, all the public one, uh, but this time I'm uh, I've been served by Azure. So in just a few minutes, you can literally uh, take any table that you have or views or store a procedure and just publish it uh, on Azure, in this case, using the API Builder and have a REST endpoint that is fully uh, working. Uh, which this enables you, Paolo, to do something pretty neat, right? Yeah, definitely. So I'll take the screen sharing. Thank you, Davide. Yep. Let me know when you see my screen, please. We can. Do you? At least I can. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So this is an adaptive card extension that I've built using SharePoint framework in order to consume the API that David just showed you built with the Data API Builder. So just to give you an idea of how it works, well, I can see a list of tasks which are related to my own account. I can play with them. I can add new tasks, for example, a, a new one with PMP. Let me add it. And if I will go back to my list of tasks, I can play with it. I can set it as completed and stuff like that. So you can play with it using SharePoint Framework and creating nice uh, adaptive card extension solutions. How uh, can we make it? Well, first of all, as David showed you, we have an application registered in Azure Active Directory in the target tenant. This is the application ID that you saw in the configuration file of the DAB uh, settings file. And here we have an expose and API setting where we have this application unit URI and we have a permission, which is the endpoint.access permission. Now, from a SharePoint framework point of view, where I created my adaptive card extension, I simply have my adaptive card extension, which in the on init method will rely on the service scope pattern to give you a clean and well architected example. Here, using the context of SharePoint framework, I simply create an instance of a custom service that I have defined in my solution. This service implements an interface, i to do service, which will do all the, or will provide all of the activities that we need to have for our to-do list. So we can list the to-do items, we can get a single item, do the add, update, and delete. So the crude queue operations. Every single to-do item will be made by an ID, a title, a completed status, and the owner ID as you saw in the uh, uh, SQL table. And then we have the actual implementation of the to-do service uh, in my solution. Here in the constructor, I simply rely on the AAD HTTP client factory object that we have in SharePoint framework so that this object, this type is provided by at Microsoft SP HTTP. And I can simply use it to create a client object to consume my unique URI, the one that you saw before in uh, the Azure Active Directory settings, okay? Now, whenever I want to consume the REST endpoint provided by Davide, I will simply need to rely on this AAD HTTP client instance object, and I will simply have to make my request, which can be a GET request, for example, to get the whole list of uh, to-do items, or it can be a post or a patch if I want to add or to update an item. But no matter what I want to do against the API, what is really important to know is that in order to have proper authentication in place, I will always need, while consuming Data API Builder exposed APIs, to use the AD HTTP client instance providing a set of options. In the options, I need to provide a custom header. Let me go into this method. In this get request headers, I will simply add a custom header, 
which will be called x-ms-api-role, in which I will have to specify the role that I need in order to be able to consume the API. This is precisely the role that we see in the app roles defined here in our Azure Active Directory application. As such, when I make a request from here, and let me show you with F12, I can make or actually better from here. Let me make a request now for the to-do uh, API right here in this page. And you will see that there will be a to-do request right here. If we scroll a little bit down, let me make much more room here. We have the, oops, most likely we have the access token right here the bearer access token. This has been inserted in the request by the uh, SharePoint framework infrastructure. We don't need to take care of it because it is provided out of the box by the AAD HTTP handler. Uh, and here we simply have a request with an access token with the sample role that Dub is waiting for in order to grant me the permission to get access to the target to do items. So from a SharePoint framework perspective, it is really, really, really easy. You simply rely on the AAD HTTP client factory. You create an instance of the AAD HTTP client object as like as it would be I of you. It is provided by Dub, and you will simply need to add this custom uh, adder to have security in place. One more and last thing you need, take a solution JSON file of your SharePoint framework solution that you need to have the permission endpoint dot access, which is the custom one we defined for our own uh, API register in Azure Active Directory. And of course, in your solution, this will be your own permission because the application in Azure AD will be registered by you with your own custom permissions and settings. That said, I think that's all. And it is a really powerful capability that you can leverage. Back to you, Hugo, and thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for for presenting. Uh, our recording will be available in 24 hours. Uh, please don't click in the chat uh, when you see that the recording is available because it's only available for Microsoft employees. We will share it on YouTube within 24 hours. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at Microsoft 365 Dev and at Microsoft uh, M365 PMP. And again, our next call for Viva Connections and SPFX is on April 6th. The next Microsoft 365 Power Platform call is on April 13th. And all community calls are available at ak.ms slash community slash call. With that, thank you, everyone. Have a fantastic day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.